You're listening to Worshipology with Curtis Parks, a biblical, practical, and spiritual conversation about leading and living worship. For more information, resources, and to get the book Worshipology, go to curtisparks.com. Now, let's lean in to today's episode. Well, hey, thanks so much for listening to the Worshipology podcast. This is a podcast for worship teams, worship leaders, and worshipers of Jesus. And every now and then I get to have somebody who's already been a guest on the podcast. Uh, Today I've got one of my closest buddies, my homeboy in worship, uh, the guy who... Uh, I don't know, we probably led more worship sets together than any other worship leader that I've been with. Um, Chris Douglas, say what's up, man. <laughs> what's up, everybody? Good to be back. Thanks for having me, KP. So much fun, man. Yeah, and if you want to know Chris's life story, we we're just joking around about this. You can go back and listen to that episode. I think it was actually in season one of Worshipology, and we talked a lot about just doing ministry. Chris is the worship director up at National Community Church in Washington, D.C., and uh, works with a lot of different worship leaders and worship teams up there. He's got so many great ideas and just thoughts and resources on leading worship. Um, but I kind of catch you at a at a cool point because we're coming right out of Easter week. Yeah. And uh, you guys did something pretty extraordinary up in D.C. Why don't you talk to us a little bit about uh, the Lincoln Sunrise Service, how that came about, and uh, as a worship pastor and worship leader, how you prepare for something of that magnitude, man. Yeah, so good. Well, the the Easter Sunrise Service at the Lincoln Memorial has been happening for over 40 years. It was uh, started wow. by a church called Capital Church, um, Pastor Amos Dodge had an idea that wasn't just an idea, but it was a God idea. Mm. And uh, it was, what if we gathered in the nation's capital to celebrate and declare uh, that Jesus is alive, that he has risen from the dead? And what if we do that right at the Lincoln Memorial? And so that first year was 125 people. This year we had about 7,000 people turn out. Um, It was an absolutely incredible time. Um, And honestly, it was just a tremendous honor just to to be able to do exactly that, to declare that Jesus has risen in the nation's capital at one of like the most iconic places on the globe, to be totally honest. It, yeah. It's unbelievable. Yeah. Unbelievable. That's so cool. I got to tune in for a little bit of it as I was driving to our Easter services <laughs> uh, here at Destination Church, and it looked amazing. It sounded incredible. What do you do uh, when you're preparing for something where it's not only going to be your church's congregation, but like you said, I mean, 7,000 plus people, congregations, not just probably there in DC, but from all across the world coming to celebrate the resurrection, like you said, at this iconic service, this iconic place. What do you do as you're preparing song choices for that? As you're preparing a team? I saw you guys had a choir. What does that look like? Is it a collaborative effect? Is it, you know, working with multiple churches? What's that like, Chris? Yeah, so so many different things there. Um, I mean, I think first and foremost is you have to recognize that you're going to have just a really wide, um, uh, wide group of people from a lot of different backgrounds and denominations. People that don't even know Jesus. This service is on the Washingtonians yeah. magazine, like top ten bucket list things to do in D.C. And so just wow. knowing that your audience is going to be incredibly diverse. And so I think for me. Um, that really impacts how we're structuring service. It impacts the songs that we're selecting. Um, it's not just stuff that I love. It's not just stuff that National Community Church loves, but it's we want to engage people in worship and create an environment where people can join in the chorus of angels and saints and, and praising Jesus. And so for me, that's picking timeless music. It's picking the stuff that everyone's going to know across denominations, or, or we're going to have the best chance of knowing, because it's not just about, it's not a, a worship concert. It's about giving people an opportunity to worship them, uh, themselves mm. in that place. Uh, That's really cool. Now, yeah. you guys have a unique opportunity there in D.C., because with a church like National Community, it's such a melting pot. You've got D.C., world cultures clashing together in your church on one row. You could have a Methodist next to a Presbyterian, next to a Catholic, next to somebody who's just figuring out who this Jesus person is. Um, How do you as a worship pastor take all of your experiences, because you have a diverse uh, Christian life that you've lived uh, in different uh, environments and different cultures and different church styles. How do you take that and lead a congregation that 
is just as diverse as the song potential could be? Yeah, that's that's a great question. And I, for me, part of my story is that I've, I've kind of swung around a couple different denominations myself. I grew up Anglican. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, the beauty of the Anglican church is it's, it's three streams. It's Catholic, it's charismatic, and it's evangelical. And so there, wow. there's, a, there's a wide breadth of, of opportunity to engage in worship from hymns and, and the stuff that we've been singing for hundreds of years to the brand new, you know, latest and greatest uh, music. And so I think for me personally, I just, I feel very comfortable in that space. Um, really finding like what's, what's good that's coming out right now. Like what, mm. what are the, what are the songs for the church, the big C church, you know? And then what are the timeless songs that like we need to keep coming back to? What are the timeless truths about God? I mean, you think about a song, Christ the Lord is risen today, right? Everyone sings that song across the board. And so um, is that what gets me most excited on a Sunday morning? No, not yeah, really. Yeah. Even, even though we have a great arrangement of it, fantastic There you go, let's go. <laughs> NCC Worship, Curtis Parr. NCC Parse. Worship, I remember those days. That's right. Uh, he is not dead, he is alive, let's go. Come um, on. But it's, it really is just trying to serve the body. Um, That's really then, good. Yeah. I think that the other thing is that we're relearning like what worship is. It's not just about singing, but it's about a heart posture. It's about connecting with God. And, and so for me, it's even, I'm trying to find even in moments where it, it might be a new song or a song I don't know, or a song I've heard once. It's like, what is my heart posture in this moment? And I think as a worship pastor, that's what we're trying to cultivate at NCC right now is, is getting back to the heart of worship. And, and really that's, that's about Jesus. And it, even if I don't know the song, that doesn't stop me from engaging in worship. Um, mm. Maybe it's, maybe it's singing a new song. Maybe it's posturing my heart. Maybe it's opening my hands and receiving. Yeah. Um, and honestly, I think, I, I really do think we have kind of a, a greater capacity of worship than we realize. And so mm. for myself and my, my team, I just want us to be a little bit more nimble, like in how we, wow. in, in how we lead worship. Um, you know, and so we do this thing called house of prayer on Thursday nights. It's, it's the, it's the most exciting thing that we're doing at NCC right now. It's wow. just getting back. It's getting back to prayer and getting back to worship. And so um, I plan this on Tuesday sometimes, Teams are still getting songs on on Wednesday, and we're yeah. rehearsing on Thursday at five o'clock for a seven o'clock service. Wow. And we're throw, we're throwing out seven songs in the set. We're we're looking for spontaneous moments. We're looking mm. for reaching back um, old school choruses, you know, renewal choruses, things like that. Mm. And so for me, I, I think we can we can spoon feed our teams. Um, just giving them everything that they need, everything that they need. Here's the map. We're not going to deviate. Or we can say, hey, it's about excellence, but it's also about following the spirit of God. Yeah. And so we we want to be nimble. We want to be flexible. We want to we want to have the ability to pivot in a moment um, to see where the Lord's going. That comes with a lot of things. It comes with years of playing together. It comes with trust. It comes with relationship on and off the platform that we're doing life together, that we can trust each other in the moment to follow. Mm. Um, It comes from just years of practice and rehearsal. It comes from refining your craft that we can do some of these kinds of things. But I think if we we're not willing to step into that moment where it's like, Hey, this could be great or it could train wreck, you know, and and that's okay. And, but we need to have places on our team where we're doing that. For me, Sunday morning, that's not the place where I want to be experimenting and, and trying new things with the team. But when, right. when, we're, when we're in a prayer room environment, yep. I mean, the, the goal is so much about seeking the spirit of God that it's like we are, we're able to step right into those moments. Um, mm. And yeah, it's so exciting. Talk to me a little bit about leading in that environment where it's very much... Um, like you said, you, you have the plan, but then you have these spontaneous moments as a leader, you know, cause I don't know about you, but in my head, like I'm, as I'm leading, I'm always like my, 
it's like my brain is kind of divided, right? It's like there's one part that's like just fully trying to fixate on what the Holy Spirit's doing. There's another part is making sure the congregation is following. There's another part that's making sure the band is locked in and synced in. Then there's another part that's keeping an eye on my lead pastor in case he wants yeah. to jump up and share a word or something like that. How do you lead um, kind of in that intentional landscape of so many things happening, but also keep it so simple to where, hey, at the end of the day, Man, it's just about following the Holy Spirit, and He's never going to lead us to a place of chaos. It's always going to be to a place of peace because the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of peace, and that's the fruit of the mm-hmm. Spirit. So, yeah. and you do that really well. I mean, there's there's many leaders that I've been around, and I've sat in worship services. I've worshipped as they led, and you do that where it doesn't seem like there's any. Uh, you know, division of your brain cells. It's like, you're, you're just kind of going for it. How do you do that and lead a team and be aware of the environment um, without kind of this worship leader, schizophrenia kind of thing going on? How do you do that, Chris? Yeah, I think first and foremost, um, it's, you, you need to worship with your eyes open. <laughs> That's I, good. Like you got to worship with your eyes open. When I'm leading, I'm constantly scanning the auditorium. I'm just looking for like physical evidence of where God is at work because wow. we, we say this all the time. It's like, we want to be partners with God. We want to partner with the Holy spirit. Mm. And, um, and, and for, that's and good. that's my, my, my prayer is that we as the band would resonate on the same wavelength and that we as a band would resonate with the Holy spirit on his wavelength, that we would mm. be in sync together and we would be in sync with him in that moment. Um, and again, some of these things come with time. It comes with trust. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of the things you hear at Bethel a lot is, is honoring the point. I don't know if you've heard, if that phrase has come up. It's, no, it's unpack, actually, unpack that. That's good. <clears throat> honoring the point. It's actually a hunting term. It's with hunting dogs. When you're, when you're, uh, you're on a bird hunt or something like that, you have the dog that's out in front and you have, you have dogs working as teams to, to see where that, that bird is, to see where that target is. And actually what they do is they stop, they orient themselves to that target and actually stick their tail up to let you know what's mm. happening. And so I think we as leaders in the room, we have to be willing to honor the point. That comes from me as a, as a worship leader when, my, past, when I'm, my pastor or whoever is pastorally responsible for that moment is sensing the Lord's doing something. Mm. If I'm over here, it's I honor the point. And honestly, the, the amazing thing when you have a great relationship with your, with your pastor and your, and your pastoral team is that that works together, that we're all actually kind of sensing that moment together and pursuing what the Holy Spirit's doing. And so there have been moments where, I mean, Pastor Mark has honored the point in, in me where it's like, oh, I see God doing something here. Yeah. And we, we kind of pause here and, and focus after what God's doing. Um, it's, it's really fun. And I, I think you just have to be willing to... Um, just willing to realize that it's going to be a little messy. Like that's and, good. Yeah. And, and and honestly, that's fun. It's, it's fun to be in those environments where it's spontaneous, yeah. uh, where you don't know what, what's coming next, where you don't know if a healing is going to happen or we're going to stop and shut stuff down and pray. I mean, we just had a, had a prayer event at, um, we had pastor Al Gordon in, um, mm. who's out of St. Church in London. Yeah. He came over, guest spoke, and we, we did kind of a, uh, a Holy Spirit evening. It was supposed to be one hour and he was unpacking his experience with the Asbury revival, a little bit of a Q and a between pastor Al, pastor Mark, that service lasted for three hours because wow. the Holy Spirit just fell in the room and we picked up a guitar. We started worshiping. We started Man. praying. We started sensing what God was doing. And you, in the snap of your fingers, it went from one hour to three hours and, and no wow. one had any idea that the time had just flown by like that. It was unbelievable. So, yeah, I saw that, uh, advertisement on Instagram, Mark Batterson and Al Gordon. And, uh, I thought about making that two hour drive last minute, but I couldn't make it up <laughs> there, but I know that was incredible, man. Um, Amazing. I want to go back to something you said earlier when we were talking yeah. about that sunrise service at the Lincoln, you know, the idea of like serving your congregation and bringing in different walks of life. You mentioned laying down personal preference. You know, that's, I literally just had lunch with a a pastor and we were talking about this exact thing um, because it's so hard when, you know, as a pastor, as a worship leader, as a worship team member, you know, you're listening to songs 
oftentimes you're writing songs or you yeah. know, there's so many things that you personally want to do or they're resonating in your prayer life, but it may not always match up with the series that your church is teaching, the season that your church is in, or you know, even the word that Sunday that your pastor is bringing. Um, what is the art of laying down your personal preference and how does that tie into everything, not just Sunday mornings, but you know, your leadership throughout the week, how you are with your teams. Um, you know, because we talk often on this podcast about, you know, humility is kind of that quintessential thing with, with worship leaders. And I think humility and laying down preference, you can't have one without the other. What does that look like for you? Um, on a weekly basis, not just on the stage. Cause I mean, obviously you do that and do that well, but what does that look like throughout the week, Chris? Well, I mean, first, isn't that the call of Jesus on our life? Yeah. <laughs> is to, is to deny yourself, carry your cross and follow yeah. me. Mm. Like that is, that is the invitation of Jesus is self-denial mm. and into, into say, it's not about my preferences. It's about service. It's, a, it's about following the example of Jesus that I did not come to be served, but came to serve that my posture as a worship leader, um, as a team leader, as a church leader, as a husband, as a father is to put on a towel to wash feet of those around me in my life. Mm. And and, and that's, it could, that could be literal, but often it's figurative that we are called to serve the people that God's put in front of us. Um, mm. One of the ways I've, I've really just kind of walked into this, I think in this last season of life is that we're a body, we're mm -hmm. a body of Christ and we're a body, we're a body for a reason because mm. I have gifts and talents that are different than your gifts and talents that are different than whoever's gifts and talents. And we actually all need each other yeah. to, to serve this, to be, um, to be the demonstration of, they will know you by your love for one another mm. it, internal in the church. And so for me as a leader, it's more about platforming. <laughs> it's more about platforming other people at this That's point. Good. I'm, I'm, I'm 36. Like, uh, it's, which is still it, super young, <laughs> which is still super young, but it's, 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 it's that, acknowledgement that it's like, what am I doing to set up the next generation? What That's am I good. doing? Yeah. Who is in, who is in my sphere that I need to take my platform and give that to them. And mm. so you talk about Easter sunrise service, you know, we, we got to work with a, um, one of my good friends named David Virgo He's at another church here in DC, Grace, uh, capital city church, tremendous like move of God there. Wow. Um, they have, they have an amazing choir. They came and sang, at our revival back in January. Yeah. And they, they were so amazing. I was like, man, would you come out and be a part of our Easter sunrise service? Cause this is so much bigger than us and we need you. <laughs> wow. like, um, you, you bring something to this city, to this service, uh, to the kingdom that, that we don't bring. And we want to elevate and honor that and, and platform that. That's so good because the way that you can tell you're over yourself is when you champion other people. And I just remember so many moments um, where there's opportunities and your pride starts to rise up a little bit on the inside. And I would often find that as like, it's almost like an alarm going off of like, you know, ding, ding. Uh, this is, this is stroking your ego. This is going to lead you down pride road. This is going to take you to a place that you may not be happy at the other side of it. And yeah, when you give those moments away, as hard as it is in our flesh, I think our spirit nature is so pleased by that because like you said, I mean, it's about championing others and you're never going to go wrong when you lift others up, when you can give your platform away. And I think that's something that's really beautifully demonstrated through what you guys are doing in DC and the nation's capital, a, a place where, you know, most outsiders might look at DC and say, man, if there's one place where there's a ton of division, it's in the capital. But what I love is mm -hmm. that you guys are part of a church and part of the body where it's like, no, if there's anything that we're going to be known for, it's unity. Um, yeah. Talk to me a little bit more about that because it feels to me like every time I kind of get my eyes on what you guys are doing at National Community, and you know, still a yeah. huge part of my heart, spent seven years there, uh, worked with you guys, love you guys still. Um, 
every time I see it, one thing that Pastor Mark Batterson is always championing is it just seems like he's always putting others before him. And what you do on your uh, team and with your musicians and with other worship leaders, um, it does seem like there's just like this, hey, you want to take the ball? You want to pass it? Like, how do you keep that spirit, not just in your heart, but see it transfer to other leaders as they take the platform, Chris? Yeah, that's great. I mean, and you you said it, it starts with Pastor Mark. Um, mm. he, is, he is the tone setter for that. Um, he is the most gracious, honoring uh, leader I've ever gotten to yeah. ever gotten to work for. And, um, and he, he's incredible the way that he just gives away. And we mm. want to be, you know, for, for us, we just want to be, we want to bless. Like we, we want to see more churches come to DC. Like we want to be partners together, not to build our church, but to build the kingdom of God and, and see, and see this city just one for Jesus, man. Like, mm. you know, in, in a place where everyone is hurling curses, everyone is yeah, yeah. cursing DC all the time. Like we want to be a people of blessing. Like we want to, we want to bless our city and we acknowledge that that's something so much, it's so much bigger than just us. And so, oh. um, so it, it starts with pastor Mark. He's the tone setter for that. And then when you get around great leaders like that, great visionaries like that, like you just adopt the vision. Like, and, wow. and for me, it's a joy to, to get to, you know, have lunch and build relationships and write songs and do life and platform other, other leaders in our city. Um, and we have, we have some amazing, amazing churches. And, um, I, I jokingly, uh, texted my, uh, my buddy at that church. I was like, man, I think you guys had the best Easter service this weekend. Like you're <laughs> y'all, y'all, y'all are my favorite church in DC. Let's go. Nice. You know? Um, and, and, and it's true. Like there's such a genuine love and affection for, um, for just different churches here. And that's all, I mean, it starts with pastor Mark. Um, but mm. it's, it's something that we want to, we want to be about as worship leaders as NCC worship as well. Yeah. You know, every church staff probably feels the weight of an Easter season, uh, mm-hmm. the planning, the preparation, maybe multiple rehearsals for a worship team, obviously going into something like the Lincoln sunrise service. There's a lot of prep work that takes place in that. Um, as you come out of it, uh, and I just saw pastor Mark post about like the Easter tide, like it's a season that leads us up to Pentecost. What does that look like for a church? Um, not just the size of NCC, but um, I guess the location where you guys are. And I mean, it just seems like there's revival happening and you're just stewarding this movement week in, week out. What does it look like? What is Easter Tide all about? And for the worship teams and worship leaders listening, um, you know, we'd often joke around, uh, there's a bit of a holy hangover that happens after an yeah. event like an Easter Sunday. Um, I know we just experienced an incredible time in God's presence um, you know, record attendance here and just hundreds of salvations. I mean, just an incredible, uh, Sunday, but how do you steward a movement and just kind of like the week in, week out, not grow weary, but keep that revival front and center, keep your teams motivated, um, keep a staff motivated, um, keep the church in a heart and atmosphere of worship. How does that kind of I guess the only word that's coming to mind, how do you keep that spirit of renewal week in and week out? Yeah. I mean, that, that post Easter Holy hangover. I mean, that's a real (laughs) thing. I don't know how you, I don't know how you woke up on Monday, but I was like, I was, I was tired, Yeah. but I was stir crazy, man. Like I, and it was raining. I wanted to go like ride (laughs) bikes and, and it was, uh, it was raining outside. And so like you had all this, Oh, I've worked so hard. We we put so many hours, so much planning, so much preparation, um, in, into this moment, and now it's done. And it's like, ah, what do I do? Yeah. Um, the the young worship leader would would stress out about that, and then the seasoned worship leader would be like, oh my goodness, I have a I have a day off. <laughs> I, have, I I can catch my breath. You know, like the younger Chris would have been on like a on a season where you don't have a busy calendar. Like, Oh, what's my purpose in life? And I just, right, right. I'm doing it. And now I'm like, Oh my gosh, I can read a book or yeah. listen to a podcast or like spend a few extra hours with my family. And so like, mm. I think coming out of Easter, it's like, 
let's catch a breath. Okay. Like, and mm. I think that's fine. If we're go, 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 go all the time, like we're, we're going to run ourselves ragged. And so like, I think, I think this season of Easter tide, it's, it's just living in the resurrection is what it is. That's but good. It's, 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 it's just this, it's this acknowledgement that Christ is, is risen. And we just take a moment to celebrate that not on one day, but we just take a season leading up to Pentecost to just celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. Mm. Um, and then, you know, we do what the disciples did too, right? We, we rededicate ourselves to prayer and fasting in this moment. So, um, yeah. you know, for us, that's, we're, we're back at house of prayer. We're, we're finding ourselves on our knees. We're anticipatory of like this move of God that's coming down. It's not like, you know, here comes Pentecost and here comes the Holy spirit, but like, you know, he's here and moving and active, but it's, it's this idea and it's the, the, the church calendar um, sets up for us. It's seasons. It's seasonal. Like we move from one celebration and then we have normal time. And then we hmm. move to another celebration and then normal time. Yeah. Normal time is like, I'm not pushing. I'm not running. I'm not sprinting. I'm not like in, you know, clutch preparation mode for something. It's just like, oh, this is my normal routine. This is my normal rhythm. And part of that is rest and recovery, you know? So wow. I think, I think for, for us, um, there's a bit of catching our breath right now. Um, take your foot off the gas pedal for a little bit, and then we're <laughs> going to get back to it. You know, yeah. um, we're, we're made for six days of work, one day of rest, right? So we work for six days and then we take it, we take a Sabbath work for yeah. six days and then we take a Sabbath. So I love that, man. I was literally having a coffee uh, meeting this morning and talking about just rhythms. Like you're going to experience, you know, 90 mile an hour rhythms. You're going to experience 25 mile an hour rhythms. And, you know, if I drive my car at 90 miles an hour all the time, the engine's going to burn out. If I drive yeah. it at 25, uh, it's not going to be any fun. And so you find that um, maintenance on your engine or for us, you know, heart maintenance, you know, throughout the fast seasons, the slow seasons, but keeping that rhythm just focused, you know, one day at a time, one step ahead of the other. I love that, man. And I know yeah. you guys, uh, you guys go fast quite a bit there in DC, man. Well, listen, we yeah. got just a few minutes remaining. I, I want to ask you this. Um, you know, what's the, what's the Holy Spirit, what's the Holy Spirit speaking to you right now coming out of Easter in this Easter tide season? What's the Holy Spirit putting on your, your, your prayer life and repeat? What do you just kind of keep resonating on right now? What's, uh, or either that or just a scripture that you just kind of been um, repeating to your heart in your, in your devotion times. What's the Lord speaking to you right now, Chris? That's good. Um, on a, on a very raw personal level, um, I think Pastor Mark had uh, just preached a couple weeks ago on, on what's the life lie that we believe about ourselves Mm. And I think this is, this is kind of a, man, this is years of work right now. Um, but my, I, I, I realized in that service, it was language I hadn't really experienced or hadn't kind of grabbed onto yet to really describe what God's been doing. But it's just, um, my life lies that I've been overlooked. I don't know mm. if anyone else can, I don't know if anyone else there, uh, resonates with that. You just feel yeah. like you've been over, you've been overlooked. And what I heard the Holy Spirit say to me, is I see you. Wow. You're not overlooked. I see you. And um, it's one thing to say it, and it's another thing to know it. It's mm. one thing to know it in your head, and it's another thing to know it in your heart, and it's another thing to know it deep down in your spirit, <laughs> in your mm. gut, that to be seen by God is enough. Mm. Um, and so when, when that realization takes place, man, oh, it's the most freeing and beautiful thing um, that it's, it's literally the audience of one that is so cliche and we talk about, but when you're living in that, that it's just about my worship poured out to Jesus and that he sees me and loves me and loves that offering that I bring, man, that's everything. That's, that's everything. Not about standing on the steps of the Lincoln leading worship for thousands of people. It's not, um, it's not about having a, a blow up hit song. It's about being mm. known and seen by the God of the universe. And, um, and I think once that really, once that really hits home, it, it's just a game changer, man. Um, wow. that, that, that'll kill, that'll take the pride away. 
That'll bring you back to a place of humility. That'll bring you back to a place of service. That'll bring you back mm-hmm. to a place of just faithful, uh, faithfulness in the, in the long same direction. Um, it's a, it's a good place to be. Uh, I definitely feel like a lot of people would resonate with that. I think, um, there's something about, uh, it doesn't matter how many times you get on a stage, how big that platform is. There's an insecurity seed, um, yeah. somewhere in all of us. And, if we allow that seed to be watered, it just grows and grows and grows. And sur- sure enough, that insecurity turns into pride. It turns into lashing out at others. Um, so if you can squash it when it's still a seed, um, by knowing what you just said, the truth of the fact is like, man, God sees you. He knows you. He called you. He loves you. Um, I mean, we all, if we're following Jesus, we want to hear, you know, well done, good and faithful servant. We want to hear, mm. this is my son or my daughter with whom I'm well pleased. And to know that in Christ Jesus, we have that. I mean, come on. Yeah. Like that's, that's everything, man. Um, well, Chris, I, I love you, man. And I appreciate oh, your time. You, you're, uh, you're one of the best and uh, now a repeat guest on Worshipology. So I appreciate your heart, bro. <laughs> Let's go. Hey, it's an honor to be with you, KP. Love you, man. You've been listening to Worshipology with Curtis Parks. To learn more and find resources for your team, you can visit curtisparks.com and grab the book at worshipologybook.com.